This is Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman. This is Will Friedle, the voice of the future Dark Knight, Batman Beyond. And you're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam. Streaming at DCAUreview.com and on your favorite podcast app. In the year 2039, Gotham City has no heroes. Its people, no hope. Its youth, no future. Evening, boys and girls. Who's up for the last? Terry McGinnis was part of the problem. You can't control your temper, and you're better if you expect to get anywhere in life. Yeah, I'll be a big success, just like you. Until a moment of violence brought him to the door of a man named Bruce Wayne. Let's put a smile on his face. Leave him alone. Once known as the Batman. <laughs> You're something. You okay? Now, the Dark Knight will rise again to drive the shadow of evil from the streets of Gotham. Let's go! Super villains, beware! There's a new Batman in town. Batman Beyond. You're pretty strong for some clown who thinks he's Batman. I am Batman. Justice returns to Gotham. Welcome to my world. Welcome, everybody, to episode 282 of the DCAU Review. I am one of your hosts, Cal, with me, my good friend, good brother, the man that runs our social media accounts. It's Liam. Liam, uh, after a two-week stint and a trip around the multiverse, we have returned back to the DC animated universe. However, we are all the way 50 years from now, whenever now is, in the future, and uh, we are reviewing a few of our uh, series that are set in the future of the DCAU this month, but we're kicking things off with the one that people actually tune in and listen to with some Batman Beyond. <laughs> That's right, and it's, uh, it's another interesting one. I feel like this one kind of snuck up on me. You know, this final season of Beyond has some pretty memorable episodes, but I wouldn't necessarily have thought of this one as high on the list. But uh, as we'll get to, this episode here, big time, uh, gives us a lot of uh, insight into uh, Terry's past and how he came to be, to, uh, to uh, coin a phrase stolen <laughs> from the Adventures of Batman and Robin VHSF. That's right. Yeah, big time. Uh, not to be confused with the Peter Gabriel so- song of the same <laughs> name, which has just been in my head uh, since watching the episode. But yes, big time. Uh, as we will get into today, we will get our full review, our four categories for this episode that originally debuted on October the 7th, 2000, meaning uh, a little over a week ago at the time of recording here, we celebrated the 23-year anniversary of this episode's debut here on the Kids WB in America. We will be, of course, getting to our official our breakdown of the four categories, but before then, we have our official IMDB synopsis for this week's episode, which is brought to you by, as it always is, The Pod Tower. Head over to youtube.com slash the pod tower right now and subscribe and you will be treated with quite an array of video podcasts featuring all things DC animation, DC animated universe discussions. If you like podcasts, if you like the DC animated universe and you like both, this is the channel for you. You will get the entire catalog from Tim Talk, which covered every episode from start to finish from Batman, the animated series up and through and including the Zeta project. You also get to the jump on the bat wagon podcast currently ongoing discussing Superman, the animated series with from our folks uh, from our friends, the folks at the watchtower database. And then uh, you'll also get our entire catalog there as well, all in one convenient place on the YouTube platform, head over to youtube.com slash the pod tower today, and please subscribe. Absolutely. So this is the synopsis for big time. Written by Bob Goodman and Tom Ruger, directed by James Tucker, music by Michael McQuistian, and animation by Coco and Dong Yang, and that synopsis reads as such. An old reprobate... (laughs) (laughs) 
an old reprobate childhood friend of Terry returns with a half-baked plan to become a big-time criminal. Is that it? Yeah, it ends with big-time criminal. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was it or if we had to cut cut for background noise. But, uh, yeah, I, th- I think extra points for using reprobate and half-baked plan. I enjoyed both <laughs> of those terms there. It's a, it's, it's a decent description for the episode. I don't think there's anything that I would take away from that. I'd, I'd give it probably a, a solid, maybe a B-. minus. Yeah, I think that's, that's fair. It, it gets the job done. For sure. But uh, yeah, we can start our our breakdown of the plot here, our own plot synopsis as we open up on the highway, the uh, the actual streets of Gotham. It's hard to tell when cars are flying and when they have wheels. But in this case, they are (laughs) they are driving on a roadway. They are not flying. Maybe it's just the super expensive like Teslas that can fly and everything else Mm. for the uh, for the standard blue collar folk has wheels still that run on the ground. But uh, on the streets of Gotham, we see a uh, a Wayne Powers truck that is uh, carrying some mysterious chemicals in canisters, uh, traveling, pulling up alongside them a giant, and I mean a giant, 18-wheeler, large enough to swallow the Wayne Powers truck whole. As they pull up alongside of it, uh, the, the men driving the Wayne Powers truck look over and see a gentleman who sticks out his hand and says, stick him up with a wink and a smile. And they sort of disregard it as some sort of joke as they uh, as the the 18 wheeler seems to speed off. But it's actually setting up the perfect spot for them to launch these two cable connected grapples and uh, attach to the side of the Wayne Powers truck and uh, and drag it into the back of the 18 wheeler. So it is, in fact, a heist attempt, something you'd see in like a uh, Fast and the Furious movie, I feel like nowadays, Mm -hmm. a. A, uh, you know, we talk about it a lot here. The Simpsons always gets the credit for predicting the future here, but this was <laughs> right out of like fast 25 or whatever. They oh are. yeah. Uh, a, a 18, we are swallowing a smaller truck in a heist attempt. So they, uh, they, they are able to swallow this, uh, this, this, uh, smaller transport truck from Wayne powers inside the 18 wheeler. Uh, they indeed do hold up the, uh, the gentleman that were driving the the truck, we see a uh, a gentleman, a strange gentleman, wearing a skin tight suit and a uh, corset and some heels. He uh, pulls up and uh, he demands uh, that they cut into the back of the item or the back of the the Wayne Powers truck. Inside, we see the canisters are there, and uh, we recognize at this point that it is indeed a hold up. Uh, thankfully though, saving the day, Batman arrives just in time. We will learn later that this gentleman, uh, in the, the skin tight suits name is Karos. And, uh, as they break in, they are attempting to steal these mysterious chemicals. The, uh, the, the guards are thrown out of the 18 wheeler. So they're taking out of the, uh, the play here, but Batman manages to, uh, engage these criminals with, uh, with, before they can make off with the chemicals. As it appears that Batman does get the upper hand, uh, one of the canisters of chemicals begins to uh, tip over and some of the chemical begins to leak out. I'm guessing that's bad. Sarah Stone, only if you touch it, taste it, or smell it. You want it so bad, Batman? We'll get the next batch. Uh, Bruce, who is radioing as he usually does to Terry... Uh, confirms that this is a can- a canister of serastone, which is a mysterious chemical that's actually not all that different than the 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 idea behind what Rachel Ghoul was doing in the in the Batman: The Adventures Continue comic book series. Mm. With uh, he's trying to create a sustainable way of creating plant life and food for generations, apparently. So uh, they they quickly determine that the whole plot here is to steal this chemical. Uh, it's a rival company 
by the name of Agrichem that is trying to get their hands on this chemical that Wayne Powers has patented. And uh, it's, yeah, it's some corporate espionage in an attempt to get the upper hand on, on uh, creating or beating the rush to whatever this magical chemical could be. So what was that stuff? Serastone is an experimental hormone that accelerates plant growth. It could revolutionize farming and make Wayne Powers billions. A company called Agrichem has been after the formula for years. The ringleader is named Karos. High-tech robberies for hire. He's been linked to Agrichem before. Get away from me! So, uh, as this chemical spills, Terry does uh, show some concern. Bruce mentions that it's only problematic if it's touched, breathed in, or uh, he gives three... It's like, if it gets on you, if you touch it, or if you breathe it in. So, don't (laughs) do any of those things, and you'll be fine. So... Uh, the the criminals r- recognize very quickly that this uh, situation is going from bad to worse. Batman has the upper hand. They decide to detach the back, the trailer portion of the 18 wheeler from their front cab and let Batman kind of go off on his own. Uh, Batman is left there to not only have to save the two thugs that he had overpowered in the back of the 18 wheeler, but uh, also luckily just for him, the chemical veers off the road in the trailer over a highway overpass and into the water with an exploding grenade that uh, Karos had thrown into the back there just for just for good luck. And uh, I guess the chemical doesn't have any effect on water uh, because otherwise the whatever that water system would be somewhat poisoned. But hey, we don't get an explanation. So I guess it's not uh, it's not affected by water. It doesn't doesn't taint the water that it goes into. Well- well, Terry's just continuing the long history of DCAU <laughs> heroes not giving a hoot about polluting <laughs> uh, his city's oceans. That's right. After. More, more of a Superman thing than a Batman thing. But, you know, he's a he's a legacy hero through and through in that way. There you go. The environmental cleanup is left to the professionals. That's not in Terry's job. Uh, uh, Aqua Girl, I guess, has to, <laughs> has to get on that pretty quickly. <laughs> Sorry, Aqua Girl. Exactly. So uh, we do, again, we get a little bit more dialogue and backstory as to what exactly is the Sarah Stone and the uh, and what kind of goes into everything. Uh, Bruce gives the the backstory to the Agrichem uh, story and and everything as the conversation. But uh, as Terry is having this conversation, he's meeting up with uh, with Dana and Max at uh, at some restaurant. And uh, for a second, I thought Terry was a good boyfriend. But unfortunately, we are just once again confirmed that Terry is just the absolute worst and that hashtag Dana deserves better because Dana is being physically accosted by a gentleman who says that uh, he's got to, quote, make up for lost time, unquote. Yeah. And uh, as Terry swoops in to perhaps uh, rearrange this gentleman's face, he rears back to throw a punch, but then realizes he recognizes this guy. And uh, this guy also happens to recognize him from way back when. And uh, needless to say, uh, Terry doesn't do much to uh, to 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 uh, defend Dana's honor in this case. And uh, just reinforces that he's the dirt. You just walk off arm and arm. Let me go. Yep. <laughs> Man, you picked the wrong booth. Big time? TT. Big time TT. Guys, this is Charlie Big Time Bigelow. Charlie was always scheming about how he was going to make it big and the name stuck. And TT is Tiny Terry because he was always thinking small. Dana, you remember Charlie. I remember who he is. Do you? Come on, Twip. What's good to eat around here? You going to buy me a burger or what? This guy who's literally physically attacking his girlfriend he's just like oh hey what's up and uh it turns out to be this guy charlie big time bigelow and he uh he refers to terry as tt because uh terry was nick nickname was tiny terry who uh he said was because he always thought small but we learn a little bit later that it was probably due to their age difference But we get a little bit of backstory here from big time Charlie, who is fresh out of the clink and uh, had just served some time. He's back out. He's looking to uh, to uh, to get back on his feet a little bit, but doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't stay out of trouble for very long as he reveals to Terry that his plan is to work with some guy that he met on the inside uh, of prison and they have a big job and he wants Terry to help him out. But Terry is uh, is quick to deny, doesn't want to mess up what he has, quickly recognizes 
that uh, this is no good and tries to tries to do the the chivalrous thing, help his friend out and uh, and decides to go right to Bruce and ask Bruce for for uh, for him to maybe get in on some some Wayne Powers work. And Bruce has a pretty succinct answer immediately. No, I can't risk it because he's an ex-con. You know about my record. You trust me with all this. You didn't spend three years in prison. That's right. He did and I didn't, all because I happen to be underage. He and I were the same, Bruce, only I caught a break. I just want to give him one, too. Absolutely. He is uh, not a fan of uh, of the idea. And uh, Terry kind of makes the pitch to him that, well, just because he's an ex-con, an ex-criminal, that doesn't mean anything because Terry is, too. And that's really... We- where we start to uh, to get into the 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 meat of this episode of of Terry's sort of feelings of of loyalty and and guilt over Charlie having spent time in prison, um, but uh, Terry does eventually manage to talk Bruce into the idea, and uh, Charlie ex- seemingly accepts the job and is ready to go on the straight and narrow, except that there are. Two mysterious men, uh, including Karos, who we met earlier in the episode, the uh, the uh, Wolverine uh, electric claw guy assassin, and uh, a gentleman by the name of Richard Armacost, uh, an executive at Ar- Agri- Agri- Agrichem, I should say, mm-hmm. this, uh, this company. And uh, it's clear that there's a, a larger plan afoot and that Charlie was actually counting on Terry getting him this job at Wayne Tech. And uh, we see uh, in the next scene is Charlie is seemingly trying to have a nice first day. He uh, he goes and he he seemingly has lost a disc behind a console and asks a security guard to help him move the uh, the move the computer back so he can grab it. But of course, this is all just a ruse so that uh, that he can get a handprint from the captain so they can use it to hopefully break into uh, Wayne Tech's lab later on. And uh, we cut to the bat cave here where Terry is uh, comes in and sees that Bruce is uh, checking up on Charlie. And Terry's really frustrated with Bruce feeling like he should trust him just based on Terry giving him his word. But it's here that Bruce reveals to Terry this uh, this this sort of trick that's been played on him as as they find out that Charlie and this Richard Armacost uh, were cellmates in prison and that clearly Terry has been a bit set up. Uh, we find out. So with that handprint they got, we find out that they're, they've made a glove. They just did, you know, this is get some real Mission Impossible stuff going on here. Super Mission Impossible. I really liked this, actually. Yeah, they make so they make a, a glove with the guard's palm print on it, which uh, should allow them to get into uh, to uh, Wayne Enterprises without much issue of tipping off security. It's clear here that Charlie and Karos don't exactly get along and that Charlie is to an extent being a little bit used by by him as well as the uh, the executive, Mr. Armacost. But ultimately, Charlie decides that uh, he doesn't feel like he's being properly repaid uh, for watching his back in jail. But Armacost tells him that he's going to trust him with this big uh, this big epic heist that they're trying to pull on Wayne Enterprises. And so this is him paying Charlie back. So. As uh, as Charlie leaves the building, he's confronted by Terry, who uh, they sort of have this argument. And uh, Charlie Charlie sort of tries to defend his actions by saying, hey, I tr- tried to let you in on this heist uh, on, in, on the ground floor, but that it was uh, it was too much for him and that this is the way he has to do it. And that he couldn't even get out now if he wanted to based on these vicious people he's working for. And uh, Terry grabs hold of this briefcase that Charlie uh, is taking that has the the palm print glove in it. And uh, seemingly they have this little struggle and Terry gets the worst of it. But we reveal very, very Batman uh, move here as Terry puts a little tracer on the briefcase. And uh, we see Charlie and them head head to Wayne Powers along with Karos and some of the other thugs from the original uh, truck heist as they're attempting to get more of this mysterious Sarastone chemical, which I guess we should note, uh, we've already talked about Sarastone in the Ace in the Hole episode, hmm. um, because the uh, the uh, episodes of Batman Beyond, for whatever reason, on the DVDs and Blu-rays and HBO are in air date order instead of production order. Interesting. Uh, but this one was obviously produced first, which is why it's sort of treated as a new concept in this episode, despite us already 
talking about it when we reviewed the that ace in the whole episode earlier this year so but regardless as uh, as the heist is going on batman of course intervenes and ultimately there is a the, there's a scuffle and Karos and Charlie are able to get away. But of course, Charlie, as he's as he's leaving, tries to save one of these canisters, canisters of Sarah Stone, but it bursts open and he's sort of bathed in it. And uh, it's clear now as as Batman gets is uh, is buried in a what is it, sand or something? That they... oil. I thought it was oil, oil at first because when he hits the canister, like uh, when Karos throws whatever he sh- or shoots the canister at the top, I thought it was mm. oil and it comes down and it's brown. And I was like, why would there just be a gigantic vat of oil in this <laughs> greenhouse? This makes no sense. <laughs> then I was like, oh, soil. That, right. <laughs> that, that makes a lot more sense. But yeah, so Batman's uh, unable to capture them. And as they get away, Charlie and Karos uh, discuss things and Karos makes it clear that... Uh, he uh the charlie owes him a lot of money since he uh they blame him for mucking up this heist and uh getting batman on their tails so charlie sort of threatened that he needs to come up with his 40,000 credits or else uh he's uh, his life might be in danger and it wasn't my fault how was i supposed to know batman would show up <laughs> This whole deal hinged on you, little man. The Charlie plan crashed, and that means it's Charlie's fault. You threatening me? Richie ain't gonna let you do nothing. He ain't the type to get his hands dirty. You don't get it yet, kid. I don't care what your pal Richie thinks. I stood to make a lot of creds on this deal, and now I'm not gonna see those creds. So they better come from you, or I'm gonna have to find some solace. and uh so charlie does what else would he do but he goes to terry once again begs him to steal the money from bruce telling him that if it doesn't happen that he could uh, he could be a dead man so it kind of sets up a, a quite a conundrum for terry as we uh, we head into our final act here yes that's right so uh as as uh charlie catches up with terry outside of hamilton high school and demands that terry help him out with these forty thousand credits that are now on his head as a bounty and then he has to steal it from bruce wayne uh, terry doesn't even consider the idea tells him that he can't uh, can't can't help him out, and uh, we clearly see that the chemicals that have spilled on Charlie are beginning to take some sort of effect as he's sweating profusely amongst uh, amongst other sort of physical ailments. He seems to be hunched over and uh, seems to be struggling a little bit. So uh, as he walks away, <clears throat> we get the kind of the rest of the backstory as uh, Max and Dana were talking about Terry continuing to get wrapped up with Charlie. Max finally gets the full backstory from Terry, which we uh, we find out was uh, Charlie and and Terry hung out a lot when Terry's parents were getting divorced. And they, he said they were both a product of uh, angry teen years, doing dumb stuff, breaking windows, shoplifting, doing a lot of a lot of illegal activities. On top of that, uh, apparently there was one particular night where uh, Charlie brought Terry along to something that Terry didn't realize until it was too late. That it was a, a heist of some sort. Uh, he went along, broke and enter, broken, broke, broke and entered, <laughs> broke in and entered a uh, someplace. And there was, they got caught by the police ultimately because he was underage. He only went to juvenile detention for, I think he says 90 days or 60 days. Meanwhile, Charlie ended up going to prison for three years so because of this terry uh seems to have this guilt that he carries with him max seems to try and tell him that he doesn't owe charlie anything and ultimately that it's not his fault for charlie choosing to do the things that he's done but terry insists that uh you know charlie still remains his friend he should look out for him and uh, has to do something to try and protect him so we uh we then flash flash to the uh, back to the the office of our of our of Karos and Armacost 
as uh, as they're there discussing exactly what's happened. Charlie, in the meantime, completes his transformation into this hulking big time beast. Uh, ultimately, we're going to call him big time going forward here, but uh, he's just sort of this Frankenstein's monster almost looking creature. He's very mm-hmm. deformed. He's got a you know a deformed face. His skin is now all gray. He's got one arm that's larger than the other and one foot that's bigger than the other. And he's now probably seven or eight feet tall on top of it. He's a he's a Hulk like creature. I'll say that not completely, I guess, because they gave him one tiny arm, but uh, very similar uh uh, conglomeration of Hulk and Frankenstein or Frankenstein's monster, I should say. But uh, as, uh, as, uh, <clears throat> as uh, Karos heads off to the back to our uh, Agricam to, to shake Armacos down for the failed heist saying that he owes him money. Uh, Batman is revealed to be standing outside the office, collecting evidence and recognizing that uh, he now has enough evidence to put them both away for some time. But uh, just as Batman is about to take both of them in big time, breaks in through the the office door, crashes into the room, and begins uh, going on a rampage of destruction. You expect me to pay you for lousing up? I've done two freebies for you already, and I humored you bringing along that nitwit. You'd have your chemicals now if we did things my way. Thank you. No, not here. What do you want? You just gave me what I want. When the police hear this, you'll both be linked to the break-in at Wayne Powers. That'll never hold up. Maybe not. But it'll hold you for a day or so. Charlie? The growth hormone. This is your fault, Richie. Look what you did to me. Now, Charlie, none of us wanted this to happen to you. No! Charlie, don't! I protected you, Richie. You said you'd take care of me. Instead, you told that head in there that he could walk all over me. Charlie, please! Look down there, Richie. See how tiny all the people look? That's what you are to me now. You belong with them. Both uh, both Karos and Batman try to stop, step in to prevent him from killing Armacost. But uh, his his uh, he quickly overpowers them, taking things out onto a, uh, a little uh, balcony outside of the office. There's a fight that ensues. Uh, Armacost gets thrown off of the balcony at one point and is hanging on for dear life. The clouds begin to roll in and lightning begins to strike, uh, really setting the mood and the atmosphere for this final scene here. Mm-hmm. And uh, Batman and Karos, meanwhile, go one on one as so he continues to to attack Batman. And uh, and so there's we have all these fights that are occurring at the same time between Batman Big time, Karos, Armacost hanging on for dear life. It's it's quite an entertaining little finale here for this scene. Uh, ultimately, Karos gets thrown off of the building. We don't know we don't know how he survives, but we do get a little fill in at the end uh, on a newscast saying that he was transferred to a hospital at some point. But the uh, Armacost is there hanging on for dear life. Batman and and Big Time are just sort of standing there looking at each other. Batman begs him to stop and tells him, you know, that he uh, he has to he has to just kind of relent and stop, but he doesn't do it. And uh, there's Batman ultimately uh, wears Big Time down to the point where he's he's exhausted, and uh, he places a final final knockout punch on uh on big time's chin sending him sprawling out as the rain begins to fall kind of really setting in the uh the the sadness that terry has for this this little finale here and what's become of his friend that he tried so hard to uh to help uh, lead a reformed life but uh in the morning we as we mentioned we get the aforementioned newscast and uh, we hear that big time was sent to prison Karos is uh, is moved to the hospital and Dana does her best to try and 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 stand by her man, even though he doesn't deserve it, uh, letting him know that it was, you know, it was the best thing to do was to stay away from Charlie. But uh, we can tell that even though Terry nods in agreement that he's still quite sad about the situation and 
that's where the the end of our episode sort of uh, ends here as our hero doesn't quite get the happy ending that uh, that we may have expected for this episode as he walks towards the sunrise. Having truly earned his street name, Charles Big Time Bigelow is being held without bail while his partner, Karos, has been moved to county general. In other news... I knew something like this was going to happen. Aren't you glad you didn't get mixed up with him this time? I mean, you'd only have gotten yourself hurt. Yeah, lucky me. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a downer ending as, as Terry sort of still has this uh, survivor's guilt. But then we can, I guess, get into our thoughts on the episode overall, the plot overall. Um, I really enjoyed this episode. Like I, like I kind of tipped up at the, at the top of the show. Uh, this was not one that was like a really remembered episode for me. Like I remembered the weird Frankenstein guy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh the character design um which we'll certainly talk about in visuals in a second but this wasn't i didn't really remember the details of it or or what exactly happened here so i thought this this episode delving a little deeper into terry's past we obviously know going back all the way to the pilot uh that he had this troubled past and we've had it we've sort of touched on it here and there but to hear him sort of discuss it and the kind of guilt he kind of in that in that first scene where he's trying to get bruce to give uh to give uh his friend the job it's it's very much clear that he looks at himself you know as kind of the same as as this guy and that the only difference was that he was underage at the time so he got the slap on the wrist while his friend went to jail and that you know everyone and so wanting to because he himself has been given a second chance and a, a chance to turn his life around in such a dramatic way. He, he so wants that for his, his former friend who, you know, kind of gave himself up and, and took, took the brunt of the punishment for, you know, a bad thing that they both did. I think it's a, it's a really interesting way of delving in deeper into who Terry is as a person and his need for, you know, his continued need for redemption of not of himself and his wanting to pass that gift that he's been given by Bruce, by his, you know, by his family, by everyone that sort of welcomed him back with open arms and wanting to pass that on to this friend who sort of, uh, you know, gave himself up in Terry's place. I think it's a, a really interesting story and, and it, it lets us know a little bit more about who Terry is as a person. Yeah, absolutely. I I think there's a couple of I I wholeheartedly agree with you. I remember the sequel, the second episode with Big Time, way more than I remember this <laughs> specific episode because I think that second episode ended up being in pretty heavy rotation towards the end uh, on Kids WB. But yeah, this episode I I didn't recall all the ins and outs of it, um, other than this guy eventually transforms into this monstrous creature. Um, I I think there are a couple of elements here that uh, that that our writers and, and, uh, and director kind of incorporated that makes this feel n like a, um, Oh, maybe an homage or, or is out of the same in the same vein as a Batman, the animated series episode. And that you have this villain that is, has this deep relationship with our hero. So he has this backstory it's similar to like the, the two face backstory, right. Where you have mm -hmm. our hero was friends with this person at one point, obviously it veers off in a couple of di different directions, which makes it unique enough so that it's not a carbon copy, but you have the idea that, you know, our hero was friends with this person feels this sort of responsibility for them, for their ultimate, for their, for their, the creation of them, right. Bruce always sort of blamed himself for mm -hmm. two faces creation and not being able to stop him from turning into the monster. In this case, even before the physical transformation, we can see the responsibility that Terry carries with him, as you mentioned, as the person responsible for where this guy's life went. Even though he was the younger younger person in the friendship, he was going along with doing things. And you could honestly look at uh, Charlie as the negative influence on Terry that really set mm -hmm. him on a path that could have gone a lot differently terry's perspective as the kid in this relate you know in this friendship sees it he's responsible he's the person that could have could have done something and he he owes this guy something because he ultimately took the fall um so i see a lot of those elements that you see 
it's just kind of twisted or a little bit different or different enough where it's not, it's not exactly the same as we've seen in previous DCAU episodes. So I really like that. I think that the DNA there is there though, because it, 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 it does have that familiarity of our hero feeling responsible, even going above and beyond the responsibility of what the people around him are telling him, Hey, this isn't your responsibility. You don't have to save this person. You've done your due diligence. You've done your go- gone above and beyond, but the hero feeling like he still could do more. Um, yeah. That's something that's always a, I think a, a good trope in a, in a story like this. And, and with the way that that was presented in a couple of different ways, I really liked that it was, there were some twists to that. Um, I also think the ultimate, the ending uh, very akin to some of the other stories that have been told in DCAU where you don't get the bow wrapped on it. We don't get Charlie getting a, a, uh, a cure, you know, for his, for his ailment. He goes to prison as this, you know, sad monster. Terry ultimately has to put one on the chin in order to defeat him. Um, and even though the bad guy quote unquote is taken care of, Terry's friend still ends up going back to prison when all he wanted all along was for this guy to turn over a new leaf. So there's a human element of that, the tragedy aspect that is played so well and, and, and gone back to over and over again in the DCAU because it's such the stories that they told were so powerful and impactful. So yeah, I really, really liked this. Um, You know, there were, you could nitpick at a couple of things. Maybe it was, it was wildly predictable or it was really quick uh, you know, they, they don't eat, Charlie doesn't even pretend to be good for like 20 seconds, <laughs> but at the same time, I think that speaks more to the, the, you're setting up this dichotomy between Terry and Charlie, right? Terry got put on a different path because of this interaction with Bruce Wayne and, and sort of accepted it and walks that line and recognizes now the mistakes that he made and is trying to be better and trying to make a difference. He saw the consequences that he faced with his dad dying or being killed by the Jokers because of his rebellious nature. And now he wants to, now he wants to, to, to be better. Charlie faced consequences being in prison three years but has no desire to, to change at all and is right back in, you know, trying to trying to scheme the system immediately. So you do get that that dichotomy between the two characters, too, which is really effective. So overall, uh, surprising to me, I will say again, going in this episode, low expectations, but I really, really enjoyed it. I ended up giving a eight out of ten for plot. What about you? Yeah, I just went to one point higher at a nine out of ten. I just uh, I really loved uh, delving more into to Terry's backstory. There's been other episodes, like we said, that sort of touched on that, where he's run into figures from his past. Um, the the episode where they, where everybody, all the kids get sent to like the the terrible school mm-hmm. um, or whatever. He you know he meets a figure from his past here or there. Um, but I yeah, I just I just thought really delving into it in in, uh, in greater detail here was really fascinating and yeah that that one little twist of fate sort of separating terry it's it's the the you know the alan moore joker one bad day right it's mm-hmm. it's every you know the the twist of fate being that terry as you said had you know met bruce on this freak night in uh you know <laughs> running away from from the jokers and it changed his whole life and now he gets to redeem himself and save others every night and help people. Um, whereas, you know, Charlie spent a lot of time in prison, felt like he was indebted to certain people and felt like he had no choice ultimately because this is sort of the only life he was, uh, you know, was given or the only, only life he'd sort of ever known. So it's a, it's a really interesting dichotomy and sort of, as you said, the, the other side of the coin of, who Terry could have been if he hadn't met Bruce that night. So uh, yeah, I think just a really, really, really great and interesting study of, of Terry as a character. So yeah, uh, hats off to, uh, to Mr. Ruger and, uh, and Bob Goodman for, for writing uh, a really interesting story and something that gave us more insight into uh, to Terry as a character. Absolutely. We will also always take more episodes that don't revolve around high school drama, which <laughs> Uh, in a weird way, this didn't, even though there there were scenes at the high school, it wasn't high school uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer stuff. So okay. it didn't turn out that like the cheerleader was in, <laughs> the head cheerleader was also involved in the theft ring or whatever. Exactly. 
All right, Liam, let's move on to our next category, which is going to be animation and visuals. And I believe Coco Dong Yang are credited with the animation for this mm-hmm. episode, as you mentioned at the top. Uh, a platform formerly known as Twitter friend of the show, James Tucker, responsible for the direction for this episode. Uh, what'd you like about our visuals? What's uh, What stood out to you as far as things other than, uh, I guess I, I already mentioned it, the design of our uh, of our sort of pseudo main baddie here, Karos, uh, is certainly interesting. We can talk about the big time design as well. Uh, what else stood out to you as far as animation and visuals? Yeah, Karos is uh, he's fierce, man. He's got those like six inch heels. He's got the heels, uh-huh. and he's got a corset. He's wearing a, <laughs> a, a corset too. I was like. Man, and it's like a it looks like a skin tight leather bodysuit that he's wearing. He's he I was like, why is he wearing that duster for three quarters yeah. of the episode? Why show <laughs> that thing off, man? <laughs> yes, and then his uh, his sort of uh, I said the the claws go on his palms, I guess, instead of on his knuckles. So mm-hmm. it's not quite Wolverine, but it's still three metal claws uh, shooting out and slicing things up. So obviously a bit of an homage there. Yeah. I think that opening action sequence on the truck is fun with Terry sort of stealthily taking out two of the, the bigger thugs and before they really know what hit him before they really know what hit them. And then, you know, kind of gets sliced up by Karos in that opening scene. And um, that, that whole sequence with them getting into the, into the front of the truck and detaching it and Terry having to pull the two, other thugs out as uh, as it crashes into the water below. I think that's pretty fun and and exciting and fast paced. And then, yeah, I think uh, as you already mentioned, the the big time uh, design is really interesting and memorable. As you said, not not quite a a, a Hulk pastiche. Obviously, anytime you have a big gray or green uh, uh, or monster, there there's going to be comparisons to uh, to the Hulk, of course, of course. but sort of mixing it with this almost sort of a zombie you know freak of nature something it looks like something out of like a resident evil game honestly yeah. it's like a nuclear um, and a, like there's almost there's some of the dna of the the main villain in the legends episode yeah also. Uh, kind of like a nuclear fallout uh warped mm. version of a guy with a you know with a deformed head and one arm larger than the mm-hmm. other and yeah, kind of like think, tum- tumors all over his face and i wonder it, i'm pretty sure mr tucker was also involved with that episode so i wonder mm. if there if that was a design of his or 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 if it was yeah something- i was trying to search for like uh to see if we could find the character model of uh, of big time to see if this was a Mr. Tucker or a Shane Glines or who exactly was responsible for that, but uh, I wasn't able to find one, but yeah, either way, that's a, it's a really striking design. And like you said, a, a good twist on the, on the big hulking monster uh, comic book superhero pastiche here. And, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think that that final sequence, as you mentioned, I can't think of too many beyond episodes that are set during like big rainy thunderstorms Mm -hmm. so i thought that was a really unique uh, the way they use kind of the lightning to silhouette uh, both karos and and big time during that final fight i think is really interesting and and kind of just adding to that very moody atmosphere as uh, as terry has is kind of forced to come to blows with his friend at the end of the episode i think that final fight sticks out as as uh, pretty impressive as well yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that that moment that you settle on where Terry looks at at Big Time who's laboring, who's worn out and he realizes at that point, you know, he has the upper hand. This is it's kind of like spoiler alert for Old Yeller. It's uh, you know, the end of Old Yeller where hey, I have to put this puppy down. Like I have to this is I don't want to have to do this, but this is this has to be done and he ultimately like delivers the final blow that knocks him out and um you know and then the rain really begins to open up and pour you know obviously a very poetic moment there because it really communicates the the sadness that he's experiencing in that moment that he's truly lost his friend at this moment and has to send him back to prison so yeah i i agree with you i think that that there's like a the 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 moment where Armacost gets thrown out of his office and he's hanging onto this railing by a thread. The railing slips and he's there holding on even further. And then they there's this shot of him hanging there, and then the lightning strikes behind him. You know, as a silhouette, it's just like 
everything about the, the the way that they use the weather in that scene to create the either the tension of what's going on, the fight, you know, as things are revving up, the storm is coming in, and then ultimately the the to convey that sadness and sorrow as the rain begins to pour down. Very effective. Well, well done uh, by our 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 storyboard artists and directors and whoever decided to make that scene. Uh, a rainy rainy sad boy scene that was uh mm-hmm. very effective with that i would agree yeah I, I think the heist scene at the beginning was also really good i enjoyed that I like the idea of having this massive truck swallow this other truck up uh the the device that they use to attach to the side of it you see the heaviness of the cables as they're they're rolling them up i really really enjoyed that um i think the uh the the i would agree with you the big time design is certainly striking and different doesn't stand out as a one-to-one incredible hulk uh copy and paste uh, especially with the gray skin but i still Mm -hmm. still enjoyed it um i i think that let's see yeah i think the the scene the scene before our finale where Batman's in the uh, taking on the 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 heist crew inside the the greenhouse or the the chemical greenhouse or whatever it is the the laboratory greenhouse with the plants and gets crushed by the giant soil. I like that that scene as the soil comes down over top of him. He you know that you see it raining down and getting heavier and heavier and heavier and him struggling to stand up as more more of the dirt pours on him and then uh going back to that first interaction with Karos, I love, we get to see how sharp and, and deadly these claws are as he scratches Batman across the back. And you see these three claw marks uh, left uh, revealing like the, the circuitry of the suit underneath. Um, I thought that everything was, was, uh, was communicated very well through the, through the different uh, night skies. I love the the purple night skies. You can see the storm beginning to kind of brew and, and start in the scene where Terry is, is sharing the information with Max about, you know, his backstory, you kind of get the, the mood is starting to change and things are starting to get really dark there. I thought that was really, really fun too, but yeah, overall um, I didn't think, uh, I mean, we get multiple action scenes here, multiple fight scenes. I thought those were pretty strong. Um, I, you know, I didn't think that there was one particular uh, sequence other than maybe the transformation. Cause we get the, we get the hints that something is going on here. We get, we get Charlie's hand begin to grow. There's like a shot of his hand and it grows to a bigger size and then shrinks. And then in the next scene, you see him sweating kind of profusely and there's additional sort of warping of his physique uh, happening there before the full transformation takes place. Um, so I don't, I don't think there was one particular sequence other than that finale that stood out, but I think that finale was so, 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 so strong and so well choreographed and, and was done so well. Uh, gave me a, a really, another really strong score of eight out of 10 for my animation and visuals. What about you? Yeah, I went with the exact same score of eight out of 10. Yeah, I think that that last sequence, like I said, the rain, uh, I feel like it rains every other week in, in, uh, in old Gotham City when we review Batman the Animated Series. But uh, this is, uh, I thought, a really unique uh, way. And like I said, the way they use the lightning to kind of silhouette, you know, the, the strikes behind the character to sort of silhouette them and cover them in shadow. I thought that led to some really cool striking poses and visuals. And then, yeah, the fight themselves, the way that the Terry kind of has to fight from underneath against this, this much more powerful foe and the way he kind of outsmarts them and kind of rope a them until he's, he's finally go, ready to go down and lands that final punch is, uh, is really dramatic and, and well done uh, and well, uh, well choreographed. Like, uh, like you said, by our, animation team as well as our director and storyboard artist so yeah i think that that scene and the opening bit with the with the heist with the truck is a lot of fun as well so yeah there are kind of two uh, book ending action sequences lifting up a uh, lifting up the episode overall agreed all right Liam, let's move on to our next category which is going to be music and forgive me i did not make a note as you were saying uh who's responsible for the music this week we have mr michael mcquistian to thank for our music this week there we go. Uh, pretty standard beyond fair. Not that that mm-hmm. isn't something to talk about or to, to make note of as we, we talk about the various differences as we go through our different series here. We're back more guitar driven, drum driven, um, synthesizer, synthesizer heavy driven uh, soundtrack here for the majority of it. Um, I will say that uh, the initial introduction of the, the Charlie character is as Terry walks up on the 
poor Dana who's being accosted. Uh, there's sort of a, a theme that plays in the background there. There's of course some heavy, heavy action beats played during the, the fight sequences and uh, the various different uh, attacks that, that Batman go- undergoes. Uh, we also have some sort of more suspenseful, Sort of uh, this guy's sneaking around and not not up to any good here when we get uh, we get Charlie work on his first day of work at Wayne Powers sort of duping the security guard into into leaving his handprint behind. So we get some some more suspenseful, uh, you know, what's going on here? What's this guy up to music uh, in the background? A little bit of like a uh, not quite a law and order, but like on that same vein where it's just kind of like notes playing and some drums in the background. And then when you get the reveal of what his plan is, it's like, ah, this is what it is. And it sort of crescendos. And then uh, we get some sad, sad music, of course, played not only in the final sequence there between Terry and big time, but then also as uh, Dana, Max and, and Terry sort of all walk away after learning that uh, he's been put back in prison. So uh, yeah, I, I didn't think that there was one piece that stood out to me necessarily, but it's good standard beyond fair, uh, you know, great, great soundtrack. Always love the, the change of pace from the, the normal orchestral stuff when we've, we've been reviewing those for a while. So, uh, overall seven out of 10 for music for me. What about you? Yeah, I, uh, I once again went with the exact same score of seven out of 10, uh, not much to add, but yeah, I thought the, they, they added a lot to those emotional beats with, uh, with Terry and Charlie, and then certainly the ending as, as Terry is sort of watching on as, uh, as, uh, Charlie slash big time gets loaded into the police van. And it's this very kind of somber note in the, in the action there, uh, missed opportunity to, uh, to bring back your favorite, the acoustic, the sad acoustic guitar, <laughs> from uh, season one but uh but i'll uh, i'll let that slide and and just say that yeah i thought it was a uh a, a good solid job like you said a- adding to the to the action beats and then and then adding a little bit to the to the emotion emotional stakes of the episode with uh you know as we said this sort of ongoing struggle that terry has uh having to confront his his friend who he feels he owes so much to All right, Liam, let's uh, wrap things up here with our final category of the day, which, of course, is going to be our voice cast and voice actors and actresses. Uh, Let's uh, let's talk about some of our series regulars, but also uh, our one and done because he gets recast in episode two. But our uh, special guest named that Baldwin brother as uh, as our main as our main baddie and uh, best friend of Terry, but also a couple of other really notable names when it comes to our uh, secondary villains. Absolutely. So. Uh, just rapid fire. We'll go over some of our, our smaller players here. We do have a uh, Gary Anthony Sturgis, who of course we would most be famous for uh, in on our show for playing Ebon on static, playing the uh, security guard that, uh, that Charlie gets the handprint from. So just I knew, I knew that that sounded like <laughs> Ice-T. I, I was going to say, because uh, for obviously Ice-T did actually play a, a splicer in an earlier episode. So I was like, did they get him back for such a small role? No, it's, it's just Gary Anthony Sergi doing, doing the, uh, doing kind of just doing the Ebon voice. So, mm-hmm. Hey, maybe this is like Ebon's uh, grandson or, or, or cut or, you know, third cousin twice removed or something. We don't know. He sounds a lot like him at least, but mm-hmm. uh, other, other, uh, some of our regular bit players we have, uh, of course we have Lauren Tom as Dana, who, as you mentioned, is just there to get physically assaulted mm-hmm. by, uh, by uh, Charlie at the start of the episode. And then uh, a couple of times tries to remind Terry of, uh, of what kind of a, a, a dirt bag this guy has been at times. And then uh, Cree Summer is Max getting to be more of the, uh, the sympathetic ear who uh, gets to hear, uh, you know, Terry uh, explain sort of uh, the, the guilt he feels. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, as you mentioned, some, 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 yeah, for some pretty big names, we have uh, William H. Macy as, uh, as Karos, the, uh, the fabulous assassin, um, pretty good. He doesn't get a lot to do, but he he does get to be a little bit more menacing. I feel like I feel like when we previously talked about him, I believe he's the the kind of the sad sack guy who helps Ink in uh, in disappearing Ink. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were not a huge fan of his performance in that episode, but he gets he gets to be more of like kind of a menacing tough guy in this episode, and I think he does a pretty good job. Yeah, yeah, he he's. 
unrecognizable, did not pick out his voice, which is funny because I feel like he has a very distinct voice. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it, I, I thought I would have recognized it. So, yeah, it's different enough where I didn't, didn't pick it out. He doesn't have a lot of dialogue. He's very menacing, as you mentioned, sort of angry all the time about everything, uh, trying clearly a, a gun for hire, only in it for the money. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think he's fine. Like, there, there wasn't one particular scene where I thought he – he stood out as like, yes, that's William H. Macy is well known for his incredible acting ability. But I think that that wasn't necessarily what this character asked for. He was menacing, evil, bad guy. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of other notable names, we have Robert Patrick playing uh, Richard Armacost, the agrichem uh, executive who's put Charlie up to this heist and also hired Caro's. Uh, Robert Patrick, of course, best known probably for playing the the uh, uh, liquid metal Terminator in Terminator Two, T one thousand. That's absolutely, and and more recently uh, being uh, John Cena's dad on the Peacemaker show. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he's he's great, and another guy who has a very recognizable voice, mm-hmm. but he's really like pitching himself. And I, I you know I give credit to him as the actor, and of course, as we always do, we sing the praises of Andrea Romano as the. Uh, as the voice director here because he's he's very like he's pitched himself up a couple of uh octaves and he's he's given this very kind of like a uh, flighty you know generic executive uh t- you know touch to his voice but when he's when he's telling charlie like well you know i deferred to your expertise while we were in prison but now we're in my world like he's got this this little like he's very kind of like generic business guy but there's just this little hint of like of slime to everything he says he's he's really good yeah it's funny also so not only you know of course his his live action roles definitely well known for those but in the dcau he played uh he also played rudy jones's friend marty martin lebeau and uh another guy that suffered from chemicals pouring on him so basically (laughs) you mr patrick uh, is needed they call him in to play a guy who someone adjacent to him is going to get chemicals spilled on him and he's going to turn into some sort of monstrous creature <laughs> that's pretty much what you can guarantee with this but uh yeah it, again yeah i wholeheartedly agree with you a very recognize a very recognizable voice um he's you know c- clearly a uh, well-established character actor that done done so so much but sets himself apart enough here where uh, yeah, I, I don't think that, that I would have picked him out as the person doing the voice. I liked, I did, the character obviously is not like a bull, but I liked the character enough to say, yeah, I believe this guy is a smarmy CEO of another company that's trying to, you know, get one over on Wayne powers and is willing to do whatever he can to, to get ahead. Uh, so yeah, for playing that character and what was asked of him, uh, again, another, another solid effort from a, from a well, uh, celebrated actor. Absolutely, and then as as you mentioned, one of the uh, one of the Baldwin brothers, Stephen Baldwin, coming in as as Charlie. I I don't think he's bad as uh, as Charlie by any means. I think he's actually pretty good in some of the scenes with uh, with Will Friedle when they're just talking. But I honestly I think that he his best work is at the end when they kind of like modulate his voice to make him sound you know big and hulking. Mm-hmm. Um, like yeah, I think he does get to show a little bit more emotion in, in that sequence as well. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think I think he does a pretty good job overall. As again, this this other side of the coin of uh, of Terry's past. Yeah, there's a couple of lines that feel a little bit a little bit forced or read or like he's you know like he's kind of just delivering the line. But I think overall. <laughs> by the end of the episode i buy that this guy knew terry like i buy that this that these guys were friends which i think is always difficult to do when you when you bring in a character that's supposedly a big part of this the, your main character's past has never been introduced before never mentioned before you have to kind of have the ability that to have chemistry between these two that makes sense that this guy does mean something to your main character so i believed that by the end of the episode um you know, uh, I 
don't know necessarily why they would have so quickly recast him in this case. Maybe it was a case where a schedule didn't work or he just, it didn't, didn't work out for him. He wasn't interested in reprising the role, whatever the reason is, but we know that uh, we, we get another famous DCAU uh, character actor uh, later on replacing big time. So yeah, I think it's fine. I think, uh, you know, I believe him as a smarmy guy that's trying to, get ahead and cut corners and is willing to do whatever he wants to do. Uh, so I guess at the end of the day, it's a, it's a good performance from Mr. Baldwin. Um, you know, maybe the third most notable Baldwin brother at this point. I don't know. Maybe, maybe <laughs> not, but uh, yeah, he's uh, he does it. He does a fine, fine job. Fine, fine for what was asked of him. Absolutely. And then of course we have our two main actors. Uh, not much for, for Kevin Conroy to do in this episode. He's, mostly a uh, exposition machine telling us what Sarah Stone is and how it works and, and uh, about Charlie's connections to this agrichem company. But uh, he does get a little bit to do with, uh, of course, Will Friedel playing, of course, Batman slash Terry. Um, and again, it's, it's a great showcase for, for Will in this episode, getting to play off not only Mr. Conroy, but as we mentioned, uh, Cree Summer and Lauren Tom a little bit in, those scenes sort of detailing his past. And then of course, a lot of work with Mr. Baldwin in those scenes with Charlie. It's, it's, it's a real, as you said, it's nice to have a really heavy character focused episode uh, after a lot of seeming uh, weeks of, uh, of, of the Buffy, you know, freak of the week character of the week thing. Yeah, I agree. I, I like that. He does get to get to show off a little bit, flex his muscles a little bit, do a little bit of uh, serious acting. I think the scene that we didn't really talk about uh, in depth when we were doing our, our plot, but when he, when he, he quickly realizes once Charlie, uh, once it's revealed what Charlie's plan was that he was had that, that Bruce, uh, Bruce asks him if, if he knew that Terry was working for him and he says, yeah, they email every now and then, or they had emailed every now and then he gets to show off this frustration of like, man, I've been had, I thought, I thought he really was ready to turn over a new leaf and here we are again. So he gets to show that frustration. He gets the sadness that we talked about, the disappointment at the end, the, the emotion that he shows to this, this loyalty, um, all of that, be, you know, has to come across as authentic in order to really drive home the, the effectiveness of the backstory reveal that we get here that you talked about that made this episode so good. So with poor acting, you're not going to be able to communicate that very well with poor acting. You're going to, you're not going to believe, as I said, this guy that we've never heard of before, he cares so much about this guy. And I think by the end of it, that comes across as authentic. So I think all of that says Mr. Friedel did uh, a really really strong job of being able to to communicate those emotions effectively and make it make me believe that this character did exist prior to this episode. So yeah, a really, really strong, uh, strong performance from him and his interactions with uh, the late Kevin Conroy, albeit brief on screen. Um, I love that he's ready to go to bat right away for his friend. And then again, we get the, the idea that he's, he's frustrated that he's been duped and uh, ready right away to try and, well, while well, yeah, he's ready to do what has to be done, he still has this care for his friend and uh, trying to to continue to help him. So, yeah, really, really great job by Mr. Fidel. Pretty unsurprising, I guess, that uh, that we would give it a high mark. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I think for all those reasons, mostly, as, as we said, on the back uh, of uh, such a strong Will Fidel performance, uh, I gave voice acting another uh, very high nine out of ten this week. Nice. Yeah, I went just a point lower, just a eight out of 10 for me, but uh, still very strong marks up and down the board there uh, for all of our scores, which will bring us to our final score here, Liam, and totaling everything up. I end up with a surprisingly high 31 out of 40. What about you? Yeah, and I'm just a couple points higher at a 33 out of 40. So uh, high marks from both of us. Um, and yeah, I think as we talk about uh, rewatchability, as we do with these main DCAU episodes, yeah, I mean, I think one, it not only does it delve more into a, you know into our our main hero's backstory, but obviously this character does come back as well. And uh, as we said, it kind of snuck up on us for being uh, a really fun and interesting episode. So uh, I think this is a, an easy thumbs up for for rewatchability, as it turns out. 
Yeah, as far as the Batman Beyond episodes, yeah, this is one to watch for sure. As you mentioned, it creates character depth. It, uh, you know, our character is certainly not in the same place that he was when he started out the episode. Mm -hmm. Um, It plays into the long term story of who Terry is, uh, his development as both uh, as as Terry and as Batman. And then, as you mentioned, the character returns in just a few more episodes down the road. So you got to know who this character is if you're going to fully understand the impact of what his return means. So. Yeah, overall, I, I I agree with you with that. It's definitely a, a recommended thumbs up from both of us. All right, Liam. Well, that will bring us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Don't forget, we would love your support. If you liked the podcast, there's a myriad of ways to do so. We'll start out with the free and easy ways to do so. You can follow us on social media at DCAU Review. If you're not doing so already, interact with us on the platform formerly known as Twitter, now X at DCAU Review, joining the conversation. We always love speaking with people about their thoughts, both on the show, on the episodes that we're watching, and all things DC and uh, DC movies, DC animation. We're talking about it all over there. Head over to DCAU Review. Uh, On that platform, you can also follow us on Instagram at DCAU Review. Uh, We post uh, not only uh, clips from upcoming episodes, we also talk about uh, various DCAU-related products and releases and posters and prints and toys and all kinds of stuff there. So join in the conversation, follow us there. You can also subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app if you're listening to us on one of the, uh, the podcast apps, Google, Spotify, Apple, especially if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, give us a five-star review. That helps us out a lot. Also, if you leave a five-star review on Apple and you leave a little paragraph, we will be sure to read it here on the air. And uh, and uh, if you're here in the continental United States, we'll try and uh, send you a little thank you gift just uh, for taking some time out because we know that that uh, takes a few seconds of valuable time. But uh, we appreciate it greatly when people leave us those uh, paragraphs telling people what you like about the podcast. Uh, if you're looking to support the podcast a little bit more directly, check out our show notes. There is a link to our shop there. You can buy a piece of merchandise if you want to to support the pod or you can uh, click on the link that uh, allows you to support the podcast monthly with a monthly donation that helps Liam and I buy like a, a coffee every now and then it keeps us awake here on the podcast, maybe medicine. <laughs> if we need to re if we need to recover from a, uh, from a bad head cold uh, that helps us along the way. So uh, we appreciate our monthly supporters that do that. And uh, if you're interested in joining them, check out the show notes. Liam, as we mentioned at the top of the program, we have unfortunately reached the end of this episode, which means we are are contractually obligated to continue this month of uh, reviews that take place in 50 years from now, whenever now is. That includes our combined uh, Zeta Project reviews, which means we will be delving back into the Zeta Library next week with another pair of Zeta Project reviews. Please tell the good listeners what sort of pain we are about to put them through. That's right. So we'll be talking about the next two episodes in uh, in air date order. I I think it's air date order. Oh, who cares? It's the order they're on and on Amazon.com. Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, in in the DVD slash. Uh, uh, no, there's no Blu-ray releases. This shows, of course, there isn't. But uh, <laughs> it, anyway, it's the next two episodes we'll be reviewing are crime waves and i kid you not taffy time so oh that's... sweet mother of mystery yep we're we're in for it it's a it's a zeta week everybody so we're cutting we're... we're cutting right through these though just think about <laughs> it we i think we've got less less than double digits left to go i think after this if we just keep on hammering so yeah. we'll uh we'll suffer through it together next week with just sure to be a fun enjoyable hey we always have a fun time regardless whether we're making fun of things we're joking along we're laughing at the 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 stupidity of some of the uh the items we also find things to enjoy in it too so if you haven't checked out our zeta project reviews before give it a shot next week you'll just get some hilarity out of it regardless (laughs) until then i'm cal and i'm liam and we'll talk to you on the next episode of the dcau review bye bye